Welcome to Final Fantasy XIV, your first day. Where it's a surprise the Empire hasn't already invaded us and taken back Alamigo, with how many weeks we took off just to be a crafter and gatherer. I guess the Emperor can appreciate the finer arts the Warrior of Light deals with. Last time, as I said, we spent time crafting and gathering. Lots of very useful things in there for getting through the curve, and some rewards besides. But even for that, we had to dip into the main story quest a little bit to get all of the unlocks. So we should push that a little bit further and go over all of the other things involved in the battle side of the content. There's going to be some work involved, but it's very worth it. Let's defend the lands we liberated. Starting off with something I mentioned in the first battle video is tombstones. I showed off the east side of Vrelgers is the new home of the Stormblood House of Splendors, but only after completion of 4.0. Now that Xenos has been defeated, Rowena has moved in and we can buy I-400 gear as well as all the other related vendors having their specific gear and rewards. Primal gear, miscellaneous stuff, and much more. There is also this Rowena representative at the Aetherite in Kugane, so you can easily buy Tome gear even when in the Far East. Be sure to buy your left side stuff first though, for reasons I'm about to go into. Last video, I mentioned we needed to join Arnvald on his adventure and go through all of 4.1 for a specific unlock. However, this time around we mentioned this not for the Gathering unlock, but to note again that we're being given coffers for gear. I think only three whole quests in the entire patch content questline give these. And this first one is accessories. This is why you should buy left side stuff first, as full right side is given for free, even if it is only item level 370. It's a good fill-in until later. During this section of the story, we will also have to deal with a duty action based solo duty. Let me say again, if you haven't, keybind your duty action. It's not going to go away. Now let's move beyond the progress we needed for the last video into 4.2. During this section, we'll meet up with Soroban and be told of a hunt for treasure. Next to the main story quest's continuation, he'll have a new side quest for us, the Four Lords. This is a fairly lengthy one, which unfortunately involves Tataru. Our first objective is a new level 70 dungeon, Hell's Lid. With that in mind, let's go over all of the dungeons we can find at level 70. Back in Kugane, we have one of the very first released level 70 dungeons, Kugane Castle. This specific dungeon has ties into other quest lines, but I do not believe they require Kugane Castle to be completed. Just in case though, get this dungeon done. Now let's head all the way back to Ryoga's Reach for several other dungeons. The first... is the Temple of the Fist, another early dungeon. Near that one is the Fractal Continuum Horde, right outside Rowena's. If you did not do Fractal in Heavensward, go do it now to get access to this part too. Similar to that, Sawney has run all the way to Railgus from Idleshire to get our help for the Arboretum Horde. Once again, if you didn't do the normal version, get that done to reach the sequel one. And then we've come full circle. Back in the Four Lords questline is the final dungeon, the Swallow's Compass. All other level 70 dungeons are part of the main story, and we'll get those as we progress. Since we have come full circle, let's talk a bit more about this Four Lords questline. It has its own little temple hub area with many animals to talk to, but that's not the main draw. In addition to the two dungeons tied to this questline, we have a set of trials. Three of them to be exact. Stupid Sexy Tiger, Thirsty Burb, and Weird Snake Man. They're all fun and pretty unique trials, if nothing else. This whole questline is extremely nice for filling out our roulettes. After completion of the Snake trial, 
the quest line will stop being a blue icon. This is actually accurate, even if you might be afraid this is a mistake. It wouldn't be the first time after all, and there's even a case of this in this video. But in this case here, there are no further unlocks. But you might as well do this last quest as it is the actual last one, and then the quest line is finished. Speaking of trials though, recall back in A Realm Reborn I brought up the Hildebrand quest line. This had three trials involved in A Realm Reborn, and it did have a Heaven's Word story continuation with no special unlocks. That's why I didn't bring it up because there were no tied unlocks. However, now that we are in Stormblood, there is a new trial involved. If you progress Hildebrand all the way up to its endpoint into Stormblood quests, a fourth trial will greet us. It's a very, very clever surprise one too. Keeping up with more trials, we have an extremely special one. Over at the Volcairo Inn in Kugane is a crossover event. Welcome to Monster Hunter. One of my favorite little things they've done. Do not worry, this is a permanent feature of the game, so you too can be a giant lion man who is surprised at the presence of a talking cat. For some reason. This particular palico will take us over to Bardem's Metal where the mighty Rathalos has made its home. Rathalos has no aggro table, acting like an actual enemy from Monster Hunter, and a duty action of potions, the only way for you to heal in the third phase. Don't forget to actively carve your reward out of Wrath's Hide when you slay it. For completion we get a pair of housing items for a tasty barbecue. and a Palico minion, which keep in mind, Calico is a type of cat, and this one is your pal, a Palico. Very punny. But that's not the end. There is an extreme version of Rathalos. It's much harder, has a new mechanic or two, and you can only bring along a party of four hunters, just like the actual game. Next to this is the trade vendor for all the reward items for the event. We can get a full set of Rathalos armor by trading in its scales. And an extreme mode only version of the armor that is dieable. And if you spend time to get a whole 50 kills of the monster, you can ride him as a mount. And he is a very majestic mount. But speaking of extreme, all other extremes of this expansion come from one NPC, the Wandering Minstrel in the Market Area. All of them. The story-based ones and the Four Lords. Each one has weapons and a mount, and Stormblood mounts are doggos. Enjoy. Moving on to the next form of content, near the Minstrel we have this burly gentleman for the Return to Ivalice Alliance Raids. You may have noticed in the distant skies of Kugane, a giant airship. If you want to learn what this is about, and enjoy one of the coolest Alliance Raid series, pick up this quest line. Also, you may remember me mentioning that the Far East doesn't have any domestic chocobos? Well, this quest line may be a good reason why. If they're all red chocobos, I doubt they can handle the number of chocobo meteors that get dropped on a daily basis. Also, imagine like 50 people trying to do this quest all at the same time. Imagine all of the chocobos, two per person, and all the meteors, and all the pain of people dropping dead from other people's chocobos because they couldn't see the AoEs. It was a mess. But it was worth it for this Alliance Raid series. Also, you will need to do this quest line for an unlock in Shadowbringers. Pop into queues when you can, and see why Final Fantasy XII is the best Final Fantasy. Now let's talk about the 8-man raid series. Post credits, we saw that the Ironworks had discovered the location of the fallen Omega. 
together with them and Nero of all people. We have to dive in and meet the cutest little chocobo ever. He is the most important character in the game. Next to the Mark 14 Thermocoil Boil Master. But Alpha is way cuter. This will be the only time I agree with a Lalafell. This all works the same as Alexander. Four raid sites in a tier, and there is three tiers for a total of 12 fights. However, with the advent of duty actions, one fight in every tier will heavily use the duty action button. Again. Again. Slot this in. You will see a lot more of this depending on what content you do. After clearing a tier, this Magitech terminal will have a quest for us. Simply, this is just an immediate unlock of the savage mode of these raids. But now there's a yet further unlock tied to this. Clearing Delta Escape V4 and Sigma Escape V4 in Savage, each will unlock an ultimate fight. Ultimate being the hardest difficulty in the game. The former unlocks the unending coils of Bahamut Ultimate, and the latter unlocks the Weapons Refrain Ultimate. All of the vendors for Omega Raids and the Ultimate Raids and the Trial Rewards are all here with Rowena. Keep in mind this NPC on the left though, as Omega Rewards are more than just gear, as is some music and furnishings too. But for all of these different content pieces, we need a way to test to see if we're strong enough to complete them. Back at the Aetherite, we had one more quest waiting for us. The Circles of Answering, which admit themselves to be just a second level of Stone Sky Sea. All the raids, all the extremes, and more, each with their own relevant striking dummies. It's not the most accurate measure of skill still, but if you need to test if your rotation is good at 70, Alpha Escape Savage at I-400 should be a good par to beat. Now for the biggest unlock of Stormblood. Over at the Splendor's Vendor, oddly, we have a battle quest. This leads us to the massive piece of unique content, the Forbidden Land, Eureka. Starting specifically with Eureka Anemos. This is such a big piece of content, it has to have its own Aetherite system, its own leveling system, and an instance player cap of 144 players. There is a lot here, and I mean a lot to go over, to the point that its own video is the only way to properly go through it all. We'll see about when and if I'll get to that, but I probably will at some point. Now is not that time. Just know the following for now. There are four whole zones total with leveling up to 60. There is a challenge log section to help you level. And this? This is the relic zone. And the base forms of the relics come from the coffers you got from your level 70 job quests. If you tossed those, time to visit a Calamity Salvager and get a new one. Oh, and duty action buttons 1 and 2 get used in this. Also, you can get an Ozma. Do you want an Ozma? I wanted an Ozma, so I got an Ozma. Now for an unlock you can't even use yet. Back in Moidona, we have the Duty Recorder. This is a useful way to watch back any fights you did, but it, it's so limited. As I said, you can't even use it yet. The only recordable duties at this moment are at level 80, and there's only two of them, and only one of those it would actually be useful for. It's a sad little thing, but what can you do? But now let's get back to the story. We left off the story when it was split off with Sorabon. We made a certain new character wait to be met. Good. Let me, let me just solve this little story arc right now. In this arc, we return to the Domen Enclave, which is now greatly fixed up, but still a bit of a wreck. It now even has its own immense Aetherite system. And by immense, I mean a main Aetherite and two small Aetherites. Near the main Aetherite, though, 
is another new feature. Kozakura here is gonna send us on a bit of a lengthy trip back to Eorzea. We have to help the Domans move back home, but there's a little bit of an issue. Resh here is the start of the Doman Adventurers Guild questline, a level 54 questline from Heavensward. It's unmarked, but at least this questline is nice enough to outright say that this other quest is required. After completion of Short Arms of the Law, the end of this questline, we can finally move on to the rest of the move back to the Doman Enclave. I do actually recommend paying attention to the questline as it's kinda cute. But back in Doma, we can turn in the quest, accept another, and turn that in to unlock Doman Reconstruction. This is not at all like the Firmament. This is instead a special vendor that we sell to for extra money. I never warned you about holding onto elegant pieces before because the money greatly added up for anything you might have needed on the journey to this point. But now, be sure to save them and sell them here when you can. Anything you sell here is an extra 20% more money in your pocket, but you are locked to a weekly 20,000 gil, but that will add up too. There's an entire storyline involved here that is nice and the ending is beautiful. Also, if you accidentally sell something you didn't want to give over, there's a little box on the side for buybacks. This all will take a month or even three to complete, depending on how much you sell off to the Enclave. But if you can afford the trip, especially if you have teleport tickets, I'd say it's worth the effort just for the story. That's not all for special story events though. As we round out 4.3 and head into 4.4, we'll be met with the quest Emissary of the Dawn. This is a special quest in that it's the first in a line of quests where we do not play as ourselves, we play as somebody else. This first one is a bit of a spoiler quest though, so let's jump ahead a bit to one that isn't as bad or even arguably a spoiler. We'll head onto the Azim step once more for the story. And let me just take a note to say, remember how I told you to read flavor text? Yeah, this one isn't just some small thing. This one's really important. But anyway, when we get into it, we get to control fan favorite cat girl Yustola. And all of these special events where we control other characters, we have extremely nuded skill sets. One or two attacks, a heal, and some kind of utility skill usually. So despite Ishtola being a white mage, she barely plays like one. No need to learn a brand new job just to succeed. Expect a bunch of these as you go along, but never fear, they're all very simple. Four or maybe five buttons at most. But none of them are as strong as Ishtola. I am. Not interested, little son. Try again when you've become a man. And let me end on one little bit of future-proofing. In Endwalker, we are getting two new jobs. Sage and an as-of-yet unknown melee job. Both of these will start at level 70 and likely have a 70 to 80 job quest series that ends at 80 and nothing more, and will probably also require you to do them for a skill. But that will be for Shadowbringers content. But let's finish the story, complete 4.4, get into 4.5, and come back here when you've done so. For we've had our ups, we've had our downs. The lies, the betrayal, the endless fighting, yet there you stand. But now it's time for the final quest of Stormblood. A requiem for heroes. The final quest, but the beginning of our welcome to Shadowbringers. Why won't they open? Please, I bid you open. Champion from beyond the rift, heed my call! Thank you for watching this episode of Final Fantasy XIV, your first day. We've made it. 
as of the release of this video, we finally, finally made it to the current expansion. Endwalker might be around the corner for a release day, but that should point to how far we've come. We are at current content. But we are still far from done. Shadowbringers gives us tons of new features too. Tons of new unlocks and a few new twists. When we continue next time, we'll finally see what this enigmatic man has to say for himself and explore all these new things Shadowbringers has to offer us. Prepare yourselves and take care. May the power of Ananid Hogs lay waste to your enemies. And the usual extra special thanks to all my patrons over on Patreon. And an extra, extra special thanks to Arya Deva, Amen Al Khatib, Benjamin Han, Body Clock, Ethan, Ethan Olson, Evan, Jamie Cotterell, Kyle Steinhauser, Melfi, Scott Stanley, and Valor LLC. If you'd like to become one of my patrons, the link is down below in the description. As is the public Discord where you can talk to me and a bunch of other people. Take care and thank you for watching.